uh, <laughs> issue on the, on the cover. Tell us about you, basically. How you started? How you managed to become a successful entrepreneur? Maybe a millionaire, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so you started back at the age of 19. I mean, you left school at 15. I, le I left school at 15 because of where my birthday lands. And um, I left school early July. My birthday is at the end of July. Um, I went and started a an apprenticeship as a carpenter. Um, of which I completed when I was uh, 19. Um, during that time of uh, doing my apprenticeship, my main objective um, at that particular time was to have the best car of all my friends. Um, so not only would I work the sort of uh, 8 in the morning till 5.30 at night, mm. I would come home, have something to eat and go and work at night time and earn some extra money to ensure that I did have the best car of my friends. Okay. Um, that was pro that was my goal, my target to, to achieve, I suppose. Uh, when I completed my apprenticeship at 19, I left and went to work for a company called Turris, um, who uh, they manufacture the, um, they were doing a site for Benford's, uh, sorry, not Benford's, Thwaites, the dumper people. Um, I was taken on at 19 uh, as a carpenter foreman, telling guys of probably my age and a little bit younger perhaps, that um, what to do and how to do it, etc. Mm -hmm. um, that was obviously quite challenging in itself for a 19 year old guy to be telling 30, 40, 50 year olds what to do. However, it didn't really phase me, I got on with it and did it. Uh, there was a guy who was coming from London to install some aluminium windows. Mm -hmm. Um, I got talking to him and I said to him, look, I will fit these windows for you at night time to, again, earn some extra money. So mm. when I finished my job at uh, sort of five o'clock, was on that particular job, mm. I uh, then continued and fitted these windows for him and earned myself some extra money. When I finished that, which um, I was probably six months into this job, mm. um, he suggested to me that I came and work for him on a subcontract basis. So I left Turris, went to work for this guy who was based down in London, and he had a, a project at Ware uh, for Glaxo, mm -hmm. and he was installing all these windows. Um, he turned up, he gave me the drawings, told me how much money I'd got to do the job, and cleared off and left me. Um, so I was left sort of looking at these drawings, uh, doing something slightly, albeit it was aluminium, I suppose. I could understand the drawings. However, I took with myself uh, a mate and uh, a young lad mm -hmm. to assist me in doing this job um, and it started from there really I'd got myself and two other guys working for me I then finished that job and went to a job in Reading um, where I was working from sort of seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night and making a lot of money but I was working hard for it um, I then progressed up to three or four more guys on top of that mm -hmm. um, and I just started taking more work on, allowing guys to install it and I watched it from a distance. I got to probably um, early 20s, very very early 20s yeah. um, and I probably got about 15, 20 guys working for me. So I mean just how at the time did you manage to find clients? You watched word of mouth or sales people? Your marketing? Yeah, well, um, I worked for this guy to start, mm. um, and he was working for a company who were manufacturing the company, very similar to Alimet that mm. we are at now. Um, he started to mess me about in paying me, so I thought, well, I. I'm going to step up the line, so okay. I went and approached the company that he was working for, um, and they gave me a chance, which obviously I was sort of cutting the middleman out, I suppose. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they gave me a chance and gave me a job, and everything blossomed from there, really. Yeah. Um, did a good job, got repeat business, they gave me more jobs. They never sort of one stopped and another one started. Mm. It was one started halfway through the other one. Yeah. So I just needed more mentor. To do it to get through it and that's how it ended up and okay. uh, just work from there okay so 
you have 50 people or 15 people working for your 20 years? About 15, 20 people yes. when I was probably 21, something like that. Yeah. So then what happened? Um, when it got to about 20, I decided that I couldn't continue to work manually and manage what I was doing properly. Hmm. So I stopped working myself and went around the sites, drove around the sites and ensured that what we were doing was right mm. to ensure we got paid. Which car were you driving at the time? Uh, <laughs> I was driving a white um, RS Turbo, Ford RS Turbo. Yeah. Which, um, it was, I don't know, it was a smoky car <laughs> in its time. Basically, you've managed to accomplish your dream at that, at that uh, age. Yeah. Having a, the best car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've, I guess, um, I've had most cars, I've had all the cars I want, I think, now. Okay. So, yes, so, please. So, um, well, this progressed from sort of 20, because I'd come off the tools, I took on more work and I took on more men. Mm. I ended up, I'd got, uh, I, I, I peaked out at around 100 people, work, 100 guys working for me, subcontracted. Um, I operated out of, a, out of my bedroom to start, really. Um, which I turned into an office. That came too much sort of being at home, um, having sort of got married in that. Um, uh, 24 I got married. Good married 24. Um, so I then bought myself an office uh, down in Leamington Spa and I got my mother sort of doing all the books and paperwork and so on and so forth and I ran things from there basically. Mm. Um, Got up to 1989, maybe missed lots of things on the way, maybe, but we got up to 89. Things were going really good and and then all of a sudden, totally out of the blue, uh, a company called Alan H. Williams um, went into receivership. Mm -hmm. um, the first I knew of it was the uh, £30,000 cheque that I had had returned to me and it said refer to drawer. So I got on the phone to the money to find out. This was a Thursday night, I can remember it very clearly. Um, I will, I phoned them up, they said, I'm sorry, we've got into receivership. I then, being naive perhaps, spoke to my accountant, spoke to my lawyers. They just suggested that I put together my claim as to what uh, that I thought I was owed by this particular company and cease work on all of the jobs that we were working on. Um, I worked with my mother and father until uh, half past ten that night um, and realised that they owed me £189,000. You, you were 29 years old? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I went and presented this to them for what good it was now. I can sit here and say, yeah, well, yeah, what a waste of time that was. But um, So I went and presented it to them. and. There was nothing you could do, basically. That was it. Yes. Um, however, I thought, right, these jobs that I was doing for this particular company, like Alimet, mm. somebody's got to finish them, and I have the best knowledge in, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go negotiate a package to complete the contracts um, for Taylor Woodrow, it was, as one of the contractors, and another company called Wolf Construction. Um, but to do that, I obviously needed funds, so I phoned my bank manager, mm -hmm. who was on holiday at the time, so I had to deal with this guy who, he and I never ever saw eye to eye as it was anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he, came, he came out immediately, in fairness to him, and saw me at my offices on that particular Friday morning, mm -hmm. and I said, um, David, I need a 150 grand overdraft facility to ride me through this. And I explained exactly what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. Mm. Uh, that being that I basically set up an hourly rate with the uh, contractors who needed these jobs finishing mm. and a margin on top of any materials that I might need to buy to do that. Um, he, um, he was hard work and I wasn't sure whether he was going to go with me or not. And um, pretty much like we are here now, I'm sat behind my desk and he's sat in front of me. Mm. And in the end, in frustration, probably the biggest call I made was I stood up and said, are you going to back me or not because I'll go and find somebody who will. <laughs> and he said, fortunately, because nobody would have backed me in fairness, Yes. Uh, he said, yes, we will back you. 
So they gave me a 150 grand overdraft facility. I then went down to London on the Monday and negotiated a deal with these guys to pay me so much per hour. I said, but I have to insist that you pay me on a 14 day payment, yes. which they agreed to. They could see the situation I was in and the only way it would work. Um, and I set the same up with the with another contract, and the show got on the road. Yeah. I ended up with 30, 40 